Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. This time we are once again looking at Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder. It's been quite a while since I did one of these. It's nice to be able to get back to this very important work. We are in chapter 8 called No Compromises? Question mark. This is a pretty short and simple chapter, but it still has a number of very relevant and important points. Right at the beginning of the chapter, Lenin says, quote, We have seen how emphatically the so-called lefts have advanced this slogan, and by this slogan he means the slogan of no compromises. It is sad to see people who no doubt consider themselves Marxists and want to be Marxists forget the fundamental truths of Marxism. This is what Engels, who, like Marx, was one of those rarest of authors whose every sentence in every one of their fundamental works contains a remarkably profound content, wrote in 1874 against the manifesto of the 33 Blanquist communards. And then Lenin quotes from Engels, this is what Engels wrote, We are communists, the Blanquist communards wrote in their manifesto, because we want to attain our goal without stopping at intermediate stations, without any compromises, which only postpone the day of victory and prolong the period of slavery. The German communists are communists because, through all the intermediate stations and all compromises created, not by them, but by the course of historical development, they clearly perceive and constantly pursue the final aim, the abolition of classes and the creation of a society in which there will no longer be private ownership of land or of the means of production. The 33 Blanquists are communists just because they imagine that merely because they want to skip the intermediate stations and compromises, the matter is settled, and if it begins in the next few days, which they take for granted, and they take over power, communism will be introduced the day after tomorrow. If that is not immediately possible, they are not communists. What childish innocence it is to present one's own impatience as a theoretically convincing argument. Unquote. So that is what Engels said. Let's break that down a little bit. So, the Blanquist communards said that they demand immediate communism, complete communism, right away, without any compromise, and without any intermediate stations. So, no transition period of any kind, and then Engels states his opinion that uh, it seems that these Blanquists, they are impatient, they don't want to wait, and then supposedly because that's what they want, then that makes it viable or doable. But Engels says that their personal impatience does not mean that it's doable. It seems if the Blanquists can't have their way, so if they can't have complete communism immediately, then they'll just stop being communists altogether. And this kind of impatient extremism is a type of ultra-leftism that we see even to this day. People who always complain that some party is not good enough, they're not achieving uh, good enough results, or some socialist country wasn't good enough, and then as a result, these people reject it completely. They say, oh, it was just garbage, it's worthless. And it's because they are impatient but it's not based on any kind of actual analysis of this situation, actual analysis of what was possible in that context and what was correct in that context. It's based on this idealistic and metaphysical notion of this is my perfect communism, and if I can't have it right away, then it's all worthless. But let's keep going. Lenin writes, quote, of course, to very young and inexperienced revolutionaries, as well as to petty bourgeois revolutionaries of even very respectable age and great experience, it seems extremely, quote-unquote, dangerous, incomprehensible and wrong to, quote-unquote, permit compromises, unquote. So obviously he's referring to the fact that um, young revolutionaries are usually a bit more extreme. So he's saying that these young communist revolutionaries he might be referring to the Russian left communists, these young communist revolutionaries, as well as petty bourgeois revolutionaries, tend to be very extreme and ultra-leftist, and they fear compromises, they think compromises are dangerous. Why is that? Well, Lenin continues, he says that, Many sophists, being unusually or excessively experienced politicians, reason exactly in the same way as the British leaders of opportunism mentioned by Comrade Lansbury. If the Bolsheviks are permitted a certain compromise, why should we not be permitted any kind of compromise? Unquote. So again, opportunism is kind of a 
two-sided coin. On the one hand, you have opportunists who say, if compromises are permissible, then that means all compromises are permissible. That's when they jump into opportunism, when they start to say that there's no principles whatsoever, anything goes. Then it becomes right-wing opportunism. But then on the other side of it, you have left opportunism, you have the opposite kind of opportunism, you have the people who say that, well, since opportunists engage in unprincipled compromises, we have to reject all compromise, and we have to just retreat basically into a metaphysical fantasy land where we only have our perfect communism and then it's all or nothing, it's perfect communism or it's nothing at all. No intermediate stages, no compromises. Lenin continues, quote, However, proletarians schooled in numerous strikes to take only this manifestation of the class struggle usually assimilate in admirable fashion the very profound truth, philosophical, historical, political, and psychological expounded by Engels. Every proletarian has been through strikes and has experienced compromises with the hated oppressors and exploiters. When the workers have had to return to work either without having achieved anything or else agreeing only to a partial satisfaction of their demands. Every proletarian, as a result of the conditions of the mass struggle and the acute intensification of class antagonisms he lives among, sees the difference between a compromise enforced by objective conditions such as lack of strike funds, no outside support, starvation and exhaustion, a compromise which in no way minimizes the revolutionary devotion and readiness to carry on the struggle on the part of the workers who have agreed to such a compromise, and on the other hand, a compromise by traders who try to ascribe to objective causes their self-interest, their cowardice, desire to toady to the capitalists, and readiness to yield to intimidation, sometimes to persuasion, sometimes to sobs, and sometimes to flattery from the capitalists. Unquote. So, in other words, in real life, there's always compromises. There's always compromises between what you want and what is possible. What is possible depends on the relation of class forces. So if the workers have a certain demand from the capitalists, whether they achieve that obviously depends on how class conscious they are, how well organized they are, etc., etc., and also how smart and how well organized the capitalists are, as well as various historical and uh, political factors. If it happens in a country where strikes are illegal, then that obviously impacts the chances of success. But then there's the other kind of compromise, which is the uh, opportunist, unprincipled compromise, basically treasonable compromise. Lenin says in the text that strike breakers also enter into so-called compromises. Lenin continues, he says, quote, of course, in politics, where it is sometimes a matter of extremely complex relations, national and international, between classes and parties, very many cases will arise that will be much more difficult than the question of a legitimate compromise in a strike or a treacherous compromise by a strike breaker, treacherous leader, etc. It would be absurd to formulate a recipe or general rule, no compromises to suit all cases. One must use one's own brains and be able to find one's bearings in each particular instance. Unquote. Let's say that the workers want a 5% wage raise. During the course of the struggle, they may become convinced, for a good reason, that the strike is going to fail and that they should end it. That's a perfectly principled and acceptable compromise. It's a different question whether that is factually true whether they have correctly analyzed the situation and whether they have correctly estimated that the strike is going to succeed or that the strike is going to fail. It would be absurd to say that we can never compromise, that we would basically have to keep striking even if we knew that it was pointless, that the strike would be lost, that the working class would suffer from it. When the working class enters into a situation of class struggle, they have to consider the risks also, because you don't want to waste all the energy of the working class and all the resources of the working class having the entire organization destroyed or something for no purpose. Imagine if workers in like Nazi Germany, they just thought, okay, let's just all go on strike, even if there's absolutely no chance that it's going to succeed or that it's going to achieve anything. And then they just go on strike and then their union is destroyed and they're all killed. Well, that would obviously be pointless. It would be adventurist, because you're just destroying working class forces for no reason. In 
Instead, what they should do is they should gather forces for long enough that they can carry out some kind of action that actually has a chance of success. Then Lenin explains that during World War I, the principal type of opportunism was social chauvinism and uh, defense of imperialism. And then after the October Revolution, the principal form of opportunism became uh, basically anti-Sovietism and defense of bourgeois democracy and bourgeois parliamentarism against Soviet power. And in response to those, the ultra-leftists rejected all compromise. And therefore, Lenin writes, quote, It is surprising that with such views, these lefts do not emphatically condemn Bolshevism, after all, the German lefts cannot but know that the entire history of Bolshevism, both before and after the October Revolution, is full of instances of changes of tack, conciliatory tactics, and compromises with other parties, including bourgeois parties. To carry on a war for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie, a war which is a hundred times more difficult, protracted, and complex than the most stubborn of ordinary wars between states, and to renounce in advance any change of tack or any utilization of a conflict of interests, even if temporary, among one's enemies, or any conciliation or compromise with possible allies, even if they are temporary, unstable, vacillating, or conditional allies, is that not ridiculous in the extreme? Is it not like making a difficult ascent of an unexplored and hitherto inaccessible mountain, and refusing any advance ever to move in zigzags? ever to retrace one's steps, or ever to abandon a course once selected and try others." Unquote. So again, I think ultra-leftists underestimate how difficult the job of the communist actually is. They make all these unreasonable demands, like, oh, we have to achieve everything without ever making any compromises, and without ever making uh, intermediate steps, and we can't ever do this and that. But Lenin says, that obviously we have to use conflicts of interest among our enemies, conflicts between various sections of the capitalist class, let's say between the national bourgeoisie and the imperialist bourgeoisie, or the comprador bourgeoisie. That's, for instance, what Chinese communists did successfully, is they used the conflict between the national bourgeoisie and the comprador bourgeoisie. We have to make compromises and alliances with potential allies, even if they are temporary allies, unstable allies, vacillating or conditional allies. Communists have made alliances with um, peasant parties, various anti-fascist forces, various anti-imperialist forces, all kinds of different groups which all had their flaws and they all had their disagreements with communists, and some of them were very short-lived alliances, but if they serve a purpose and they advance, the progress towards socialism, then it is acceptable. Ultra-leftists, on the other hand, they might say, okay, we can't ever make any alliances with anybody else, so we can't make alliances with um, anti-fascists if they're not communists, or if they're not workers, bourgeois or petty bourgeois forces that are anti-imperialist. They just categorically reject all of that. But again, then there's the opposite danger, which is the right-wing opportunist idea that you can make alliances with anybody. In this chapter, Lenin actually mentions national Bolshevism. He says that some um, German left communists actually wanted to make alliances with uh, extreme nationalists against the Versailles Treaty. But things like that never work. There's a reason why communists cannot make alliances with uh, certain people. Like, there's a reason why communists can't really ally with fascists, why communists can't really ally with imperialists. Obviously, it goes against communist principles, it goes against communist morality, but it also just simply would not practically work. And communist morality actually is based on uh, what advances the movement towards socialism and communism and what advances the welfare of the people. All right, so then Lenin says, quote, Our theory is not a dogma but a guide to action, said Marx and Engels. The greatest blunder, the greatest crime committed by such out-and-out -out Marxists as Karl Kautsky, Otto Bauer, etc., is that they have not understood this and have been unable to apply it at crucial moments of the proletarian revolution. Political activity is not like the pavement of Nevsky Prospect, the well-kept broad and level pavement of the perfectly straight principal thoroughfare of St. Petersburg, N.G. Chernyshevsky, the great Russian socialist of the pre-Marxist period, used to say, unquote. 
so yeah, politics is not a straightforward road. It's not a straightforward path. You have to try things. You have to make alliances. You have to make compromises. You have to retrace your steps. You have to reevaluate. And I think the whole thing with right opportunism and left opportunism is that they are too lazy to think. It's so intellectually lazy to just say, okay, we're not going to accept any compromises ever. Or to say, okay, we accept all compromises. We don't have to think, we don't have to critically evaluate each separate case. Like, okay, is this an opportunist thing? Or is this a reasonable thing? Then Lenin gives concrete examples of uh, compromises from the history of Bolshevism. He says, quote, Prior to the downfall of Tsarism, the Russian revolutionary social democrats made repeated use of the services of the bourgeois liberals. That is, they concluded numerous practical compromises with the latter. In 1901 to 1902, even prior to the appearance of Bolshevism, the old editorial board of Iskra, consisting of Plehanov, Lenin, and various others, concluded, not for long it is true, a formal political alliance with Struve, the political leader of bourgeois liberalism, while at the same time being able to wage an unremitting and most merciless ideological and political struggle against bourgeois liberalism and against the slightest manifestation of its influence in the working class movement. Unquote. I recommend you read the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolsheviks short course, which talks about in great detail about these various situations. But basically, at that time, communists were simply trying to spread the ideology of Marxism in Russia. There wasn't a Marxist party yet. They were trying to create one. They wanted to spread the ideology of Marxism. And they had legal possibilities to do that at the time because the Tsarist government was more concerned with eliminating Narodnik terrorism, which was a form of anti-Marxist utopian socialism. So as a result, the communists briefly sort of collaborated with uh, the so-called legal Marxists who were actually not real Marxists but liberals. They worked with them against Narodniks. But what prevented this from becoming an opportunist policy is that they did not uh, dissolve themselves into liberalism. Instead, they maintained their ideological independence and they still criticized the bourgeois liberals and the so-called legal Marxists, who were actually not genuine Marxists at all. They still criticized them, even though they also collaborate with them. And that's a key thing. Every time communists make alliances, they still have to retain their own independence. They have to retain their own communist point of view. If they make alliances with other anti-fascists, they still have to think, okay, we're communists, we have certain differences with these other people, but we also have certain shared objectives. Lenin continues, quote, The Bolsheviks have always adhered to this policy. Since 1905, they have systematically advocated an alliance between the working class and the peasantry against the liberal bourgeoisie and Tsarism never, however, refusing to support the bourgeoisie against Tsarism, for instance, during the second rounds of elections or during second ballots, and never ceasing their relentless ideological and political struggle against the socialist revolutionaries, the bourgeois revolutionary peasant party, exposing them as petty bourgeois democrats who have falsely described themselves as socialists. During the Duma elections of 1907, the Bolsheviks entered briefly into a formal political bloc with the socialist revolutionaries. Unquote. And, quote, between 1903 and 1912, there were periods of several years in which we were formally united with the Mensheviks in a single social democratic party, but we never stopped our ideological and political struggle against them as opportunists and vehicles of bourgeois influence on the proletariat, unquote. And that's an important point, because although Bolshevism appeared as a separate political trend already in 1903, they only finally separated from the Mensheviks in 1912. Between that, they sometimes were more united and sometimes less united. There was the so-called uh, London Unity Congress in 1907, when Lenin thought that perhaps they could unify with the Mensheviks again. However, that ended up not working. But in all these different situations, the Bolsheviks, they criticized Menshevik opportunism and Menshevik mistakes, but they tried to unite with them when something could be achieved by doing that. For instance, Lenin from the Bolshevik side and Plehanov from the Menshevik side, they made an alliance against a group of right opportunists in the Mensheviks called Liquidators and against a group of left opportunists in the Bolsheviks called the Otsevists. So they were trying to collaborate 
in trying to defeat the worst opportunists. But at the same time, Lenin still understood that there were differences between him and Plehanov, and he never stopped criticizing Plehanov for his uh, opportunist mistakes. Lenin says, quote, During the war, we concluded certain compromises with the Kautskyites, with the left Mensheviks, and with a section of the socialist revolutionaries. We were together with them at Zimmerwald and Kienthal, and issued joint manifestos. However, we never ceased and never relaxed our ideological and political struggle against the Kautskyites, Martov and Chernov. Unquote. So, during World War I, Lenin tried to unite all the anti-war elements, even though they had various disagreements. Some of them were more pacifist, and even the ones who weren't pacifist, they still didn't uh, accept Lenin's call for uh, turning imperialist war into a civil war, and Lenin never stopped criticizing those people who did not accept the Bolshevik policy, but it was still beneficial to try to create an anti-war international. Then he goes on to say that, um, quote, at the very moment of the October Revolution, we entered into an informal but very important and very successful political bloc with the petty bourgeois peasantry by adopting the socialist revolutionary agrarian program. At the same time, we proposed and soon after effected a formal political bloc including participation in the government with the left socialist revolutionaries, unquote. So, as is well known, they had a temporary alliance with the left SRs until the left SRs split from them. So, as you can see, there were quite a number of uh, situations where the Bolsheviks made alliances and compromises, but only so that they could advance socialism. So then Lenin asks a question. He says, quote, a gradual shift of the worker masses from the Mensheviks over to the Bolsheviks was to be clearly seen in 1917. At the first All-Russia Congress of Soviets, held in June 1917, we had only 13% of the votes. At the second Congress, we had 51% of the votes. Why is it that in Germany the same and absolutely identical shift of the workers from right to left did not immediately strengthen the communists, but first strengthened the midway independent party? One of the evident reasons was the erroneous tactics of the German communists, who must fearlessly and honestly admit this error and learn to rectify it." Unquote. So he goes on to explain further, but basically what he means is that the German communists took such a left extremist position that when the workers started moving to the left, the communists were still so far to the left that the workers could never come to them, that the workers could never reach an agreement with them. So, as a result, they were forced to create this uh, sort of centrist party between the rightists and the communists. Whereas if the communists had made some compromises, they had sort of met the workers halfway. If they had met the workers where they were at, they could have convinced them. And then lastly, this is what we're going to end with. This is what he says, quote, Capitalism would not be capitalism if the proletariat were not surrounded by a large number of exceedingly motley types intermediate between the proletarian and the semi-proletarian, who earns his livelihood in part by sale of his labor power, between the semi-proletarian and the small peasant, and petty artisan, handicraft worker, and small master in general, between the small peasant and the middle peasant, and so on, and if the proletariat itself were not divided into more developed and less developed strata, if it were not divided according to territorial origin, trade, sometimes according to religion, and so on. From all this follows the necessity, the absolute necessity, for the Communist Party, the vanguard of the proletariat, its class-conscious section, to resort to changes of tack, to conciliation, and compromises with the various groups of proletarians, with the various parties of the workers and small masters. It is entirely a matter of knowing how to apply these tactics in order to raise not lower the general level of proletarian class consciousness, revolutionary spirit, and ability to fight and win." Unquote. That's really the key issue, because these days we see a lot of people who say that we have to make all kinds of compromises with uh, this imperialist power or that imperialist power, or we have to make compromises with uh, far-right nationalists, or with uh, conservatives, or with uh, whoever. Or, let's say, um, there's a lot of people who say that we shouldn't criticize religion. They say, okay, the masses are religious, therefore we shouldn't criticize religion. That's fine. If the masses are religious, then you shouldn't unnecessarily insult religious sentiments. That's fair. But it becomes opportunist if communists start to say, okay, there's no contradiction between religion and communism, or there's no contradiction between materialism and religion. 
because there is a contradiction. You can be tactful about it. You don't have to always be just screaming about uh, atheism, depending on the situation. And that goes for all these other things as well. However, the rule of thumb is, are you trying to raise class consciousness or are you lowering it? Because if you are just pandering, and if you are, in effect, liquidating communism, then you're lowering class consciousness. If the masses are conservative, and you say, okay, well, we're just gonna become conservatives as well, then you're just liquidating communism. When what you should be doing is trying to reach the masses and trying to convince them that they shouldn't be conservative, that they should move forward. 